Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Digitally Uploaded Podcast, the companion podcast to digitallydownloaded.net. I'm Matt Sainsbury, the editor of Digitally Downloaded. And with me this week, we have Matt. Hello, Matt. Hello. And we have Trent. Hello, Trent. Hello. Everyone seems to be a bit upbeat, and I, I, I'm i just weirded out now. <laughs> well, I'm awake now, you see. Usually when we record these podcasts, we record them just one a week. But because I'm in Japan as of, well, by the time you hear this, um, we're, we are recording this well and truly in advance and we're straight after the, the last podcast. So I'm actually awake now. This is me when I'm awake. I'm actually much perkier than I usually am. Um but yeah, I, I need some scotch in my orange juice. <laughs> it's um, it's an odd one this week. We have we, can, we we won't be talking about any news. So if anything dramatic has happened over the last week, well, well, there um, will be because Nintendo's going to reveal the circle. Because they've um, you know, for Labo, how they did like a reveal ah, yes, video yes, beforehand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the circle thing, the fitness thing, it's going to be revealed, and everyone's going to be like, I'm going to listen to the podcast to listen about the circle thing and it's going to be like we're going to be talking in a past tense that it hasn't been revealed yet and everyone's going to be disappointed that we weren't able to give our fans the best news of the week yeah it's it's odd we um as of the time when we're actually recording this all we know is that nintendo's got like this stretchy circle thing that you stick your uh controllers into and do exercises with so at the moment that's (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I haven't heard anything about this. I'm well, you'll have, really to go and check it out. you'll have to go onto the twitters.com and um, to check it out, Matt, because, yeah, there's this rubber circle thing that you stick your Joy-Cons into and then you can imitate archery actions and do, I don't know, hula hoops and stuff. And, yeah, this seems to be the next Wii Fit kind of thing, but for the Switch, which is odd because you need to detach your Joy-Cons for it. And Nintendo's about to release a console version of the Switch, which doesn't have detachable Joy-Cons. Well, to be fair, though, it only <laughs> plays on the console version then. So then it's you won't be able to play it on the lights. You'd have to have it on the TV screen. For me, I, my prediction is it's going to be called the Switch Band. That seems like a plausible name. It's going to be more like Connect than like Wii Fit, and it's going to be more gamified and a bunch of gamey stuff on it, like archery and stuff. Maybe like a Wii Sports kind of. I really like Connect Sports, so if it's like Connect Sports but on the Wii, I'm down. Uh, wow, on on the Wii. I mean, on the Switch, I'm down for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything that gets people up and active is good for me. So I'm 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 interested in finding out more about this. Um, and on top of that. If you are wondering why we're not talking about the, any news that came out of Tokyo Game Show, again, it's because Tokyo Game Show hasn't, hasn't actually happened when we're recording this. We're gearing up towards it, but yeah. So no news this week. We're talking about more general stuff, and hopefully we don't bore you to sleep. But firstly, we're going to go to some Hatsune Miku music. Um, 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 nostalgic. That's the one we're going to play, and then we'll come back and talk about stuff.
Welcome back, everybody. Okay, so to start this podcast this week, we're going to talk about, I, I guess, stuff that I am going to do at Tokyo Game Show, but by the time you hear this, I have done. So this is going. This is very Twilight Zone. Um, but yeah, uh, every year when I go to Tokyo Game Show, I get to do a lot of interviews with various game creators. Uh, it's basically my best chance of the year to catch up with uh, the various Japanese games that I enjoy. Uh, and in previous years, I've had some really good ones. Uh, the Caligula Effect Director, uh, that was a great interview. I've met Goichi Suda a couple of times and so on and so forth. So uh, let's talk about some of the games that I'm going to be interviewing for this time around. I guess the first one is I have an interview with Gust for Fairy Tale. Uh, so just before we recorded this podcast, Gust announced that they're making a RPG based on the fairy tale manga and anime series, which is a big one. And um, yeah, it's interesting because usually when Koei Tecmo does an anime licensed tie-in, it's a Warriors game, but this time around it's a RPG. And Matt, do you know fairy tale much? Are you vaguely interested in this one? I am vaguely interested in this one. I've, I'm not hugely familiar with fairy tale aside from just having heard of it. Um, but it looks quite interesting, and from what I know of Fairy Tale, I think an RPG is going to be a much better fit than a Warriors style of game. So yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, I think it, I think it could be really good. I mean, this is Gus's first licensed title, so we don't know how they're going yeah. to handle the license. But apparently, um, the the actual manga writer is closely involved with this one. So That's what good. that means, I don't know. I mean, it could be marketing talk for have one meeting. <laughs> you know, at, the start, at the start of production and just told them roughly what he, he likes to do or it could actually mean he's actually deeply involved we don't know I mean that's they always play games with words and, yeah. and stuff when they're talking about this stuff but fingers crossed he's involved that's the main thing but part of me is a little bit only slightly disappointed that it means that Gus isn't doing some, another original something of their own but I'm sure it'll be very good yeah, way. yeah, it's actually an odd one. I mean, Gust has got right into churning through the Atelier games. Uh, that's this year. We'll have three Atelier games in the span of one year, which is a bit nuts. Uh, I do have an interview with the director of uh, Atelier Riser, which is the one that's coming out in a couple of months. Um, but yeah, it, it's disappointing. I, I, I like Gust when they do more creative kind of stuff. Uh, Blue Reflection is one of my favorite games, uh, and the R. Tonelico series from the PS2 and PS3 era. That was a great series that they haven't looked back at. Um, and there is, of course, Knights of Azure, which I really enjoyed as well. So those kinds of experimental stuff that Gus does is great. But Fairy Tale might be it, I guess. That's their new thing. Um, just be interesting to see if they can get some of their own creative ideas in there. I'm sure they will. Well, I just googled fairy tale. I realized what it is. I only seen a few episodes of the um the anime, but it's got the cat in it. I know what the cat is, so I'm down for the game. <laughs> yeah, maybe the cat's playable. Maybe it might be like Morgana from Persona Five. Maybe it's a really powerful fighting cat. <laughs> Sounds good. <Powerful laughs> fight. Powerful fighting cats. I don't know why that description just made me laugh, but <laughs> cat apparently is something I find humorous. <laughs> um, so moving on, I also have probably the interview I'm looking forward to most that uh, I have at Tokyo Game Show, and again, you'll get to read all about it probably by the time you hear this podcast, but uh, I have an interview with the director of Utawara Ramono series, and I love Utawara Ramono. I love it more and more every time I play one of these the games at the moment at the time of recording i'm actually playing through utawara ramona zan for review and that's the new one that's coming out just about now um but yeah it's a it's a lovely series i don't know have you played it i know you probably haven't trent but have you played it much no okay. you keep telling me to play it and then i do i, I do. never do and so now you know how alan feels Although, in defense, Alan's, Alan's game recommendation takes you like three hours to play through. Mine is an 80-hour 80, 80 visual novel RPG, so I'm asking you for a bit more of a time commitment, I admit. But, um, yeah, Utawara Ramono, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, it started its life out as adult visual novel thing, um, which means, you know, nudies and sex scenes and stuff uh but then went legit <laughs> and uh there's it, it's now a series of kind of tactics rpgs mixed with um visual novel and 
it's really interesting because it takes a lot of elements from very traditional Japan, including native uh, Japanese Ainu culture, and the aesthetic is quite gorgeous and unique as a result. Um, and yeah, they're just they're, they're lovely games. So I'm really looking forward to to picking the game director's brain about um, where the ideas come from. And I guess I'm also really interested in that transition from adult game to kind of mainstream, um, as mainstream as these things get, but mainstream um, genre or mainstream series, because there's a couple that have done that. Fate's another very famous example of one that's that's made that transition quite successfully. So, yeah, it, it interests me. Um, what else have I got? I've got an interview with the creator, the writer of Raging Loop, which is a horror game which I think comes out in October. Is that right? I think Sounds it's October. Right. Yeah. yeah, so P-Cube's publishing that one, but uh, it's a Kemco-developed game, and I'm honestly amazed that Kemco is actually giving me an interview with anybody. Uh, obviously, they haven't read my reviews of their RPGs, but um, yeah, I'm, I don't know. Have you, you guys looked at Raging Loop much? These are Switch games, so I assume, Trent, you've heard of it? Uh, or not? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is a horror game. Uh, it's a kind of werewolf horror game i believe um but a japanese take on a werewolf and um from what i've read or what i've heard it's actually a very very good it has never been localized into english before but obviously uh, there's a it's been out in japan for a while and people have been talking about it and apparently it is very good so yeah i'm quite keen to find out more about that one what else do a I get? A local to do? tradition known as the feast. Yeah, that sounds yes. interesting enough. <laughs> yes, it, it it looks like it has that kind of um, group dynamic of something like a Danganronpa, where everybody ends up trying to screw each other over to, you know, survive. <laughs> um, and yeah, it looks like it has that kind of psychological thriller to go with the supernatural horror stuff, and it's quite nice visually. Uh, I quite like the art style. So, yeah. I also have an interview with, finally, I, I can't believe this, I, I catch up with Koei Tecmo every year, but I've never actually had a chance to interview anybody from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms strategy side of things. But I actually have an interview with um, the producer of the next Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And that's really, I'm really keen on that one. I love my history and I'm always keen to find out how they go about researching these kinds of games because Romance of the Three Kingdoms is quite an in-depth study into Chinese history. And yeah, I'm, Matt, I know you've played, you, you, you ended up playing Three Kingdoms, right? The Total War one? No, it was one I tried to play, but my computer wasn't really up to the task. Ah, uh, right. Have you played a, you haven't played a Romance of the Three Kingdoms either, have you? Me? No, no. <laughs> I, the close, all I've played is Dynasty Warriors. Right, Dynasty right. Warriors, Which is like, related, but yeah. But I, no, I think I'm looking... Now that I don't hate strategy games anymore, I am I'm looking forward to playing the new one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, hate thanks strategy. To, thanks, Civilization, for that. Yeah. That's, Matt, Matt, Matt is the uh, ultimate example of how civilization really is the gateway drug to strategy games because, yeah, you're right into them now, and that's all because of Civ. Good old Civ. See, I played Civilization, and then I started playing some of those, um, what was it, the Euro Euro Europa ones? That those kind of... Uh, Europa Universalists? Yeah, I started playing them, and I'm like, no, this... No, no. Trent. That's I think that's a, bit, that's a bit of a jump, yeah. That's Yeah, that's like going from trying dope to going straight to heroin. That's, <laughs> that's not the path you take. You need to, you know, steps in the way there. You need cocaine and, you know, LSD on the way to, to the ultimate. <laughs> um, Welcome to the All Ages Digitally Uploaded Podcast. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we just got ourselves banned. <laughs> banned with the Australian Classification Board. <laughs> Drugs, drugs associated with perks or something. That's that's the line. <laughs> perks <laughs> and, and, and mixed with games. Game, game yeah. perks. Yeah, that's it. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. There is one that I think uh, I have an interview with a developer that for a, a 3DS game, um, which I didn't get a chance to play. So I don't know. You guys maybe did, and if so, tell me questions to ask. 
the Alliance Alive. I have an interview with the director of the um, the Switch port of that. So, did either of you play Alliance Alive by any chance? No, <laughs> not me. Well, what help are you? <laughs> not so, so, I, I like I like when Matt is on the podcast because it makes me feel less bad about not playing the games other Matt suggests. <laughs> I'm not suggesting it. I don't know anything about this game. I'm, I'm hoping somebody at some stage tells me what I, sh- <laughs> what I should be talking to this person about. All I know is that the Alliance Alive is a uh, Furu game that is very retro, retro-themed. retro Maybe you should uh, not talk about the game. Talk about his favourite food, places to eat in Japan, like, I don't know, like, hobbies. Maybe suddenly the interview will be, like, the best piece he's ever done. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Just make the interview nothing at all about the game and just... <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Friends, I'm sure that like talking over a beer. <laughs> I'm sure the guys that um that organised that interview as part of their PR for the game are going to appreciate <laughs> that. Um, they can be very picky if I don't ask enough questions on the right lines. Um, and I think that pretty much covers off everything. Um, I'll also obviously be checking out the indie section. And when you go to the indie section at Tokyo Game Show, you get swamped by people trying to get you to interview them. Um, <laughs> it, it's like. You, you get to be. I like to go to the indie section because I like to feel like I'm, I'm some kind of special celebrity. Because I walk through, and as media, they all, you know, you got your media badge on, so they know that you're a journalist. And yeah, they all surround you, and you feel like you're a rock star for <laughs> one minute, if you like. Um, but yeah, apparently Tokyo Game Show this year is the biggest one ever. It's got 600 and something booths or something uh, exhibitors and 2,000 yeah. 2,000 spaces of booth. So yeah, it's it's going to be a Big, big event and should be, I'll, I'll have plenty of coverage up on Digitally Downloaded about that. On that note, we're going to go to some music. I don't know what we're going to play. Let's play music from Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Yeah, let's go good music.
Welcome back. Okay, so for the second section of the podcast this week, we are going to talk about a topic which has blown up a bit at the time of recording. Obviously, by the time um, you listen to this, it's not going to be quite so timely, but it is a topic that keeps coming back over and over and over again. And I don't think we've actually ever addressed it in the podcast. So, yeah, we're doing this. Uh, And the topic is, are reviews subjective or objective? Or should they be? So um, the news at the time of recording is that there was a music artist, I can't remember her name right now off the top of my head, but she reacted very poorly to a review from a very experienced music journalist. And was it, when it, was it um, Lana, Lana Del Rey? That's the, the one. Artist? Thank yeah. you for filling me in on that, Matt. Anyway, if you go and research it, it's a couple of weeks old once again because we're recording this podcast so far in advance. But, yeah, she reacted very poorly to a review from a very experienced journalist, I think from NPR. I think that was the publication. And basically criticised the journalist for the criticisms that were reflected in an otherwise pretty positive review, actually. And then on top of that... Um, a fellow by the name of Brian Fargo, who is the studio head of In Exile Entertainment, which is the developer behind the Bard's Tale series, went out with a tweet, and I'm going to read it out because it's hilarious. Um, I'm reading Metacritic reviews from professionals on a game, not mine, and I see most scores ranging from 80 to 100, and then a few sad, sad scores as low as 60. What's your thoughts on such discrepancy? And that's a nonsense tweet. Um, but... <laughs> It just goes to show you that there are a lot of people on the creative side of the industry. Um, So we're not talking about the gamers because the gamers ever ever so often blow up about how reviews should be objective and all that, and it's nonsense, and we all know that. But we kind of expect the artists to know better, and there seems to be this this thing where the artists don't know know better, um, and they seem to think that there's some capacity in which game reviews need to be objective. And or there needs to be some kind of objectivity built into a review. And I think it just goes to show that there's still a lot of misunderstanding about how criticism in art works. And yeah, Matt, your thoughts? Um, I think that all game reviews re- reviews reviews should be a hundred percent objective at all times. Oh yeah, of course you do, Matt. You, you've never got a you've never got an opinion in any of your your reviews. That's there's, for sure. there's no place for opinions in the esteemed science of reviewing toys. Yeah, so just a second, <laughs> I'm going I'm to pull up your review of uh, SNK Heroines <laughs> and read that out because that's an objective review, right? There wasn't any opinion in that one. No, that was just pure <laughs> science. <laughs> no, but I guess seriously, more seriously, yeah. anyway. Um, <laughs> it's, I, I can't say anything serious because just the whole concept of review should be objective is so like bizarre and nonsense to me that I can't think of anything serious to say about it. <laughs> I get the sense to try and, I guess, spin this in a positive light for some people um, that do ask for reviews to be objective. I get the sense that perhaps in, in some cases... Um, these people who are otherwise you know, pretty smart people, you would assume, um, perhaps don't, they're not using the right word for it, I guess. Um, obviously, reviews need to be professional and thought out and substantiated. I guess that's pro- probably the, the thing for me. That's a, that's um, a better word. Yeah, yeah. Sub- substantiated. substantiated is probably the right word. So what yeah. I mean is that, you know, you need to be able to back up your opinion. So if you've got an opinion on a whatever, be it a game, film, music, p- painting, you know, um, you might not like the Mona Lisa, for example, and that's okay. Um, everybody else likes the Mona Lisa. Obviously, that's why it's worth more money than anything else out there in the art world. But if you don't like it, then that's fine. It's about being able to substantiate why you don't like it. That I think differentiates it. So once you can substantiate your opinion on uh, a work of art, then there's no real way to criticize what you've written. And I think that in a lot of cases, um, when people criticize reviews for being subjective, they're actually just criticizing reviews that are <laughs> not particularly well written um, and don't actually have that level of substantiation. In some cases they do as well, but. Yeah, in most cases, I, I think it's more just that the, the review isn't, it, it's not defended well enough. Um, 
that's my very anecdotal take on it, I guess. I think you're about right. I mean, I think there's also an, an element of, for a lot of people, there's this expectation that, I mean, people think that a review of a work of art serves the same function and purpose of as, you know, a review of a kitchen appliance and we want to know, like, does it work well and is it, should I go out and buy this thing, which is, I mean, fine if you're buying a toaster and you want to know what is the best one that's going to suit the what you want to get out of your toaster, but I don't think it really... Reviews of art can't serve that same purpose. Video yeah, games I guess... can't toast. <laughs> yeah, video games can't toast. That's, that's a good way of putting it. I like that. But yeah, I think I think you're right, Matt. I think that there is still that perception that art is a product within certain sections of the community, let's say, and that includes, for whatever reason, the people making the art. <laughs> um, and the minute you reduce art to a product, then it becomes a set of features. And um, if you only look at art as a product, then you actually do only care about the set of features. And that's a conversation that, you know, shows up in so many different ways in the games industry. Like the, the number of people that are obsessed with how many hours you get out of a game. That is a consequence of turning a game into a product where the number of hours equals the feature and therefore the more hours, the better it is, which is, which is nonsense because, you know, a game can be an amazing game at one hour and it can be a terrible game at 100 hours in length. But because we... Persona 5. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm not allowed to actually say that one anymore because I always use that as my example of a really shit game for being too long. But um, it is. It's actually a bad example. It's, it's, an, it's a, not a terrible game. It's just a game that... <laughs> Would be plus, a plus, we story. ranted about it in the last podcast, and for everyone listening to this a week later, it just like just seems like it's just a different new rant about the same thing he ranted about like the week before. But for us, we got the grunt of it. He's talking about this all the time in in the intros, in the outros, in the spaces between the podcasts. He's like Persona Five shit. It's all because of Trent bringing it up. <laughs> but um, yeah, but. It, it, it is the case that uh, you know, if you, if you product product eyes a game, then actually it, it makes sense that the, the number of hours that you get from it is better because it's just like if you productize cans of soup, if you get a five hundred mil can of soup, it's better than a three hundred mil can of soup. Um, so I I think that uh, the call for reviews to be objective comes from that same place where you're just looking at the raw features and that is the extent of the game. Um, and it's Does maybe this come from like a lot of review sites back in the day, like the late nineties, mid to, uh, O's, you know, that kind of thing were all, they were, the reviews were less, you know, free form like they are now. They're more, okay, well, this is the graphics in the game. This is a sound in the game. This is, a, they were more dot point and more, you know, this is the features of the game, A plus, you know, sort of thing. Like, is it that sort of review writing has caused some um, leftover signatism in the industry, which people are picking up on and going, oh, well, you know, some sites still do it, still do it this way. Why aren't all the rest like this? Is that a problem? I think so. I think that's probably a big part of it as well. Yeah, it, because video games are obviously the newest art form. Um, the uh, the the way that people talk about video games as an art form is still a maturing thing. And yeah, if you look back at the way that people wrote about um, films back in the the early years of the films, it, it was very much the same kind of thing. So it, it takes a while for a language around an art form to establish itself. And I think that's part of it for sure. I think the other part of it is that um, it suits the video game makers that people talk about games as products rather than art, because uh, when you talk about products, it becomes very, it, it's much easier to predict how your game's going to perform in terms of the media response to it, in terms of the critical response to it, where if you can say, oh, okay, so, you know, because my game's a, a product, it's 100 hours worth of content and it has 
70 different guns to shoot and they're physically accurate and it has ragdoll physics and it has multiplayer with you know it has a battle royale multiplayer if it has all of these features if it checks all of these open it's an open world game if it checks all the boxes therefore it's going to get a good review that's what happens if it is um a productized thing if it's a objective review where there's a set set of criteria for a game to be good that's you know that's how you can predict that so the i think the game publishers actively try and encourage this perception that games should be uh criticism should be objective whereas if it becomes subjective then all of a sudden just because it's an open world game it's not good just because it's a you know it, just because it has 100 hours of gameplay it's not good and that becomes much more difficult to actually get a good response from because all of a sudden you need to i, I guess you need to produce something that people like <laughs> not just play but like and yeah. that's that's harder that's much harder I think also for particularly for some developers and some publishers, it also means having to think about their what their game actually says, what is actually the what, what, what implicit whether they want it to or not. What are the actual messages that people are going to take away from the game? And if you're making Call of Duty, that's not something you want to really have to think about. Well, yeah, absolutely. You can't wash your hands and say our game is not political. <laughs> <laughs> If all of a sudden, um, you know, people looking at games uh, subjectively because whether you intended it or not, there are going to be messages in there that people are going to pick up on, and they are going to um, they're going to talk about that because it's not political. But the new Call of Duty has uh, what do you call it, the chem chemical stuff to white like phosphorus. Uh, white, white, yeah, white nothing, phosphorus. Nothing, nothing political about white yeah, phosphorus. Yeah, yeah, almost, almost <laughs> about to have Agent Orange or everywhere. Like you know, it's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and then you don't get to get away with being Bethesda, get up on stage and go, we've got nuclear bombs in our game, yes! And then people are like, yes, I get to drop nuclear bombs on people. That's not really, suddenly that's something that you want, might want to talk about, um, which is good. I think that's healthy for the games industry and as a development, in the development of a, as a form of art. But again, um, overcoming the, the difficulty of having you know, publishers out there preferring to deal with influencers because influencers treat games like products. Um, having to deal with creators ripping on you for having opinions about their games or their art, and then having a community get very upset with you if you're not um, if if you're not confirming their uh, their opinions on a game that they haven't even played it becomes very difficult to be subjective in video game reviews, which is which is why you should be very thankful that we are here at digitallydownloaded.net and we don't give a crap what other people think. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have opinions and we're going to talk about them and, yeah, we just... If we, if we think My Name is Mayo is a 5 out of 5 game, we'll say so. Oh, yeah, damn straight. <laughs> See, see, what I think is weird is um, this sort of stuff is really inconsistent. Like when it comes, like in terms of objective reviews in the industry, or when people think a game should have objective reviews. Like it could be fine when you know, on for certain games that oh, this is okay, blah blah blah. Then all of a sudden, people just you know, hound on certain games. It's like, oh, well, you know, this is a horrible game. All these reviews are, like, not objective, blah, blah, blah. And it's just it's focused to that one particular game rather than what's out at the moment. Like, there may be five other games in similar sort of vein, like, you know, shooting games or, like, open world games, but it may be targeted towards one particular Yeah, I think what you'll find, Trent, is that the the technical and official definition is a review is objective if you agree with the opinion being expressed. <laughs> if you disagree, yeah. then it's subjective and bad. But if you agree, then it's all good. Yeah, that's it. You're you're a good you're a good critic as long as you're actually giving people exactly what they want. <laughs> the minute you say something they don't like or they disagree with, you're stupid and bad and a terrible writer and so on and so forth. It's it's fun being a games critic. It's so much fun dealing with comments from certain people it's, it's a perfect segment to segue into why watchdog one Do, watchdogs one is better than watchdogs two i mean what <laughs> now i was about to make the the example of um on my my astral chain review <laughs> i had a great comment from somebody <laughs> I saw it, this. It, yeah i had a great <laughs> comment 
from comment from somebody on my astral change review who was like oh so you gave this game eight out of ten um but you gave omega quintet nine out of ten that's some yeah and then apparently that made me bad or something because astral chain is objectively better than omega quintet or something i don't know i get very confused. probably doesn't have bad bosses at the end that's probably why you reviewed it one point higher no, no, don't you understand? I, I hate, I hate, I hate platinum games or something. That's why I gave them a eight out of ten for uh, Astral Chain and called Near Automata the greatest game of all time. See, see what also why I hate. It's been around for ages. Is people look at review scores? They're like, oh, eight out of ten. That's a bad review score. No, it is not. Eight out of ten <laughs> is good. Like. It, yeah, it's really like it's. I saw something like ages ago. It was like a meme post, but it was like film reviews, like a you know an average film. It was like you know five out of ten. Like it was like the middle range was closer to okay. This is just an average you know popcorn flip film. But whereas like video games, it was like a bad game is like eight, and then it has to be a nine to be a good game, and ten. Like it, it just seems like games are condensed into that one high ends of review scores there is a there is a reason for that trent um and this is i mean this is just just to round off this section because we've gone far too long bitching about objectivity um but (laughs) the reason that that is the case is because gamers game playing people uh do know that uh, in a lot of cases bonuses are actually tied to the metacritic score and uh, game developers will get their bonus only if the game has a a Metacritic average of 90 or above, for example, for a AAA game. So if you are a critic and you give the game a 7 out of 10 in the eyes of these fans who seem to think that they actually need to physically defend their their favourite developer, they uh, they get very upset that you've ruined their bonuses, the bonuses for the, the game developers or something. That's their logic that they seem to go by so the reason basically that um game reviews are higher is because um the well the perception of an average game being higher is because yeah that's the bonus system in too many game developers is tied to a game getting some astronomically high score for being just a good game the industry needs you to unionize that it does that's another topic for another day, though. <laughs> it, it does. Um, but, yeah, let's go to some music before we start talking about unions. And um, we'll go to... What, what music will we use? We'll use music from... What's a good game? There are no Astral good games. Astral Chain. <clears throat> Fine, Astral Chain.
And welcome back, everybody. So, to finish the podcast off, and once again, we're recording two podcasts back to back, so I've nearly lost my voice anyway, so I really need to wrap things soon. Um, we're going to talk about Pokemon, or Pocket Monsters, or Pokies, or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Pokies? <laughs> yes. Pokies. Um, yeah, so there's a new Pokemon game coming out, and we all know it's going to be terrible because it doesn't have a national dex and so on and so forth. Do not write us angry letters, fans. We don't care. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, let's talk about Pokemon in general because Pokemon's been around for a long time. I do love my Pokemon, um, but I like the older Pokemon more, I'm going to say. I think Pokemon Blue and Gold were my things and i was much more addicted to the series back then and i think the reason is back then it was much more focused these days there's not it, it's so much more <laughs> unfocused with so many other things to do like uh, the new one uh, where you cook curries and stuff I, I don't understand this i do not understand why why are we doing this i mean i i assume that pokemon need to eat but why are we cooking them curries can somebody explain this to me I mean, I think the question you need to ask is, why wouldn't you cook them curries? Okay. Um, <laughs> Look, but... I think no, no. For a serious answer, <laughs> like let's let's put. I, I think the curry is a feature because I think they've got these safari like zones where they're like open world in a route sort of sections where it's like bigger than normal. I think the whole aspect of that is they want you to make it feel like you're going on a journey through these routes and part of that is sitting down with your pokemon making your curry and then you know continuing your journey i i think it's designed to make it feel more like a survival sort of fun time with your pokemon aspect obviously optional but it will give you like a boost or something like say like the berries of old or the um the dancing mechanics in uh some of the older games where you go to do like the things and the pokemon just love you a little bit more like i think that's the as like what the effect would be and the idea is that you're in this world you're exploring it's great i think you're probably right I also think maybe the people at Game Freak just played Final Fantasy XV a lot and really enjoyed it and thought, well, <laughs> why can't we do that? And that's I why you know. don't have your national desks. See, I, I never quite got into the cooking system in Final Fantasy XV either. What I ended up doing was basically just making instant noodles for my team every time <laughs> they sat down to have dinner. It was a good packet of instant noodles. Um, plus, you know, Galvatronics or whatever his name was, <laughs> Gladius. What's his name? The Beefcake Dude. I can never remember his name. He's the only one I can remember. Gradiolus. Um, Gradiolus. Yeah, that's the guy. He likes the instant noodles, so, you know, don't make him angry. He'll hit you. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I, For me, Pokemon is about running around, collecting Pokemon, fighting them, and that's it. I don't... I don't know. I, I started to lose my interest in Pokemon a bit when they started to ask me to play dress-ups and fashion contests and all that other stuff that they started to throw into these games. Whereas I really just wanted to have the kind of 3D battles on my N64. <laughs> um, and, yeah. That's but... where Stadium came out. See, I, I think we can all agree the last good Pokemon games were black and white. Well, see, even then, black and white still had all this other stuff in it. It's just Yeah, the, but it was, it was after it, fans were a bit, you know, oh, the other games were shit, that sort of thing. Like, And so like, it was sort of like a little mini reboot. It had stuff, but it was toned down a little bit. You, they, they, it's optional, Matt. Come on. Yeah, it's, but it's optional. It's bloat. <laughs> it's, it's bloat. It makes these games too much like Persona 5. Um, <laughs> there's... They just do that with so much. Yeah, yeah, you had to work that in somewhere. I did, I did. It's not, um, it's not really a podcast if we don't complain about how long Persona Five is. That's true, <laughs> but it it is true that I find these games too too bloated. And yeah, sure they're optional, whatever. But bloat is bloat, and there's always that tension that you feel like you, you know, you're not doing everything if you don't go and do these things, which sends my OCD into overdrive and. Um, they just become too busy and too much like work, and I don't know. I, I like my my games to be much more focused and simple and clean, and really execute one idea and and do it well, or one concept and do it well. This this stuff just doesn't add anything to Pokemon. Um, I don't mind it if it's 
a, a side game like if they were to develop something completely around it like pokemon snap for example i think is great even though it doesn't involve catching and fighting pokemon i think as a side game it really does a lot to to build out the um the pokemon franchise um but yeah <laughs> fashion shows and cooking curry as much as i like curry uh, all it's going to make me want to do is go and cook a curry in real life and stop playing the game. So, <laughs> See, I think for better or worse, the new Pokemon games are definitely going to be a new tonal shift. It's definitely going to be a mini reboot. You look at stuff like the anime, it's been named back to Pokemon. There's rumors that Ash isn't going to be a character anymore. He's going to finally win the, the whatever league they're up to, and he's just going to piss off. Like that's, that's like the current rumor and that it's just going to be a soft reboot. I think that that's what they're doing in general with Pokemon right now. It's going to be a repositioning. It's going, the national decks has been removed at like, not, uh, just because we hate gamers, we hate fans, but because they want to focus on some Pokemon, give, have the more, you know, this is the new ones, these are the old ones which we really care about, and then advance and rebuild Pokemon from there. I think it's a mini reboot. I think it'll be a tonal shift. It may or may not be better or worse, but I think it will be definitely an interesting time for Pokemon fans. Which is fine, but, you know. Didn't need the curry. <laughs> it, it reminded me of Lost in Blue, really. Like, See, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna be so fixated on this bloody curry thing now. It's going to drive me nuts. And I'm, I'm going to hate the game on principle because I just don't understand why the curry it needs to be in there. Um, as long as I can make magic cup skewers and some, and some um, sushi, and it'll be great. Well, that's the other thing. What is in that curry? Is it like Pikachu? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like you're out in the wild and you're cooking this stuff, so which means you've got to get the game somewhere. And I assume, unless they're all vegan in this world, they must be eating Pokemon, right? Well, there are, there are no other animals in the Pokemon world, are there? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So is it, I mean, what's the bull? Tauros. Is it like a whole bunch of, you know... Is, is uh, it, uh, yeah, the, the bit they didn't show in the trailer is the bit where you actually, before you can make a curry, you have to pick which which of your Pokemon you want to use as the meat. <laughs> that's, Maybe that's, it's just an ambiguous beef or chicken or something. Maybe that's how it's going to be labelled. Like, I, I would actually love that. If that was the way it worked, that would be brilliant. If you actually had to sacrifice one of your Pokemon to keep yourself fed. That, <laughs> That is the, this is a survival game that Matt's wanted all the t all the time. He complains about survival games not being real, like being too realistic, murdering animals, that sort of thing. But this is the game he wants all the the, the whole time. Just imagine how pissed off all the parents are going to be. Like how how much anger there would be at Pokemon, like directed at a game freak. But parents are like you making my kids, you know, k kill animals and stuff. Oh, I can imagine the. It's just gonna. It would be amazing. That would that. This is this is what I want to see now. I actually do want the curry in there. I just want <laughs> them to do it right. Make a good pidgey curry. Course, which causes like kids to be um, meat eaters instead of vegans or something. I don't know. Like I, I can see the articles now. It's gonna be great. <laughs> well, it's only because it would be hilarious because all those parents would write in very angry letters and whatever, and they'd be, you know, drafting up the letter while they're cooking steaks for their kids for dinner. Um, because, you know, this is how these things work. People don't have that. People have that cognitive dissonance where they'll, they'll be meat eaters, but the minute you depict a, a meat, you know, the, the process of getting meat onto the plate, um, that's, that's too much for some people. See, maybe Pokemon is in a futuristic world where we lab grow our meat and, you know, it's still your cow, it's st still your, you know, chicken, but it's lab grown and you get your cut and everyone's happy. <laughs> the end. Yeah. No fur is murder, no dead animals, just organic, good, wholesome meat. Yeah, plant-based plant meat, plant-based burgers with the uh, artificial blood put into them. Did you guys see that? This is wildly off trap topic now, but yeah, I'm no, but, but there's that, but there's also <laughs> there's also research into like actually physically growing organs and using that as meat. That's what I'm talking about, like that kind of like actual still butt in real blood, like that's the future. 
Wait, are you talking about biting into chicken and it's bleeding? But Trent, you probably should cook that chicken a bit more. <laughs> you know, like beef. <laughs> beef, right. Okay, now I'm on track with you. No, but... I, I... <laughs> a good wholesome steak. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a very interesting direction that Pokemon's taking. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently now it's all about uh, genetic lab-grown meat and um, and plant-based bleeding burgers and. No, no, see, that's, that's the see, it, it makes it makes sense for the Pokemon world. It's got like, oh, it, it's very scientific. Like everyone lives a wholesome modern-day life, but there's some weird shit going on when it comes to like. The technology side of Pokemon, like they they can put Pokemon in Pokeballs. Like I don't know how they do that, but there's some sort of science there. Like they can make wholesome, grown, real meat slabs, and just it's not actually killing animals. It just comes. Like maybe maybe Professor Oak is actually like a farmer. I don't know. <laughs> just imagine how much. Just imagine how much uh, stewing you'd need to do to before you could eat a Geo dude. Like you'd have to really soften him up a bit. Isn't Geo dude a hundred percent rock? Like that's he'd he'd be more like salt. You like grind. How could he? Geodude, how could he be a hundred percent rock? Salt. There'd have to be something in there inside. It'd be like a, a a clam or something. Like inside, there's still organs and things, right? I don't know. The Pokemon has some pretty weird laws if you read the Pokedex. Like, I don't know. Maybe crack it open and there's like a clam. That makes sense. But it'd be pretty like. I mean, no point. You just grind it, grind it down like salt, natural Pokemon salt. Oh, that could work too. Yeah, Geodude's a seasoning. And oddish <laughs> leaves. Put some oddish leaves on your um on your curry. <laughs> yeah, but not the oddish itself. I bet the oddish is like poisonous, like so many of those other plant things. Like the leaves are okay, but the the actual root is is poison. Oh well, yeah, po- oddish is like a has like a poison, all the poison moves and stuff first off. So it'd be pretty. Like you wouldn't want to touch any of those plant-based Pokemon. I mean, it would explain why Farfetch is always so pissed off, though. Because it's and a how, duck. How like, about speaking about how you love Farfetch? How about that new Pelican Pokemon? I don't You've like. Gotta Pelican. be in love with that. It's like a blue Pokemon. It like eats fish. Well, that's a Pelican, yes. But no, I'm not. A, I'm not a huge fan of Pelicans. They look. Yeah, weird. but you love Farfetch. It's like yeah, your. It's a go-to different Pokemon. animal, Trent. A duck is not a pelican. <laughs> a duck is not a pelican. They're actually very different animals. I can I can yeah, point you to the Wikipedia page. You can page. see this. You can see this. This pelican will be like eating your curry. You'll be feeding it chips, like that kind of you know wholesome fun nest. You just know that because that pelican's been announced, there's no far fetched in the game, though. Yeah, that would make me sad. But there will be a Psyduck at least because they won't get rid of Psyduck. They need to keep Psyduck. They can't get rid of Psyduck. No, they can't get rid of Psyduck. Did you guys see the... Have you seen Detective Pikachu? The Psyduck is the best thing in that movie. I was going to say, anything in Detective Pikachu is probably going to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the decks for, like, the game. Yeah. Wildly overpowered. Psyduck could basically destroy the entire planet, which is pretty hilarious when you think about it. <laughs> and I'm all for that. Um, anyway, we're going to go to some music, <laughs> music because that was a... That was, that, a note. that was a clusterfuck of a section, that was. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> We're going to wrap up now because we've all gone loopy and stuff. Thank you very much for tuning into the podcast. We're going to finish with the music from the ghost town in Pokemon Blue because that's creepy and it's going to creep Alan out in editing and that's his punishment for not being on the podcast. See you all next week. Thanks very much. Bye.